neurons are sterile, so the thing doesn't go right through there. Plants are a little bit more promiscuous. Many plants can, even into adulthood, get genes from other plants, not every single gene, but some genes, and they can give genes to other plants, which means that plants are a little less reproductive, isolated than horses and, and donkeys. Finally, bacteria and viruses are completely promiscuous. Not only can they pass their genes to their offspring, they can take genes from all the bacteria and mix them with their own. That's how the swine flu that just emerged, emerged. When you analyze the DNA of the swine flu that just hit Mexico and eventually started hitting everybody else, you can tell that it has certain portions of the avian flu that came up like a few years ago, but also portions of, of pork flu, and, and it's just a combination because bacteria are so promiscuous, they don't even form species. They form strains, and they last with an identity that lasts for much less time. So species are born at a particular time in history. That particular time in evolutionary history, of course, that particular time at which they become, uh, their gene pool doesn't receive alien genes from the outside. And they die. They die when they become extinct. Which basically means that species are in are sorry, singular. Let me explain this. Individuals. Now we use the term individual to refer only to either persons, that individual, this individual. Individual human beings, meaning this person, that person, and also to refer to individual organisms. My dog is an individual. My cat is an individual. This particular flower that I have in this flower pot is an individual. But when we go, when it comes to species, the species are supposed to be above individuals. Why? Because Aristotle says so. Genus, species, individuals. And species are supposed to be a category that's ontologically different than that of individuals. But, but when we realize that species can be born at a particular point in time and they can die and disappear at another particular point in time, it shows you that they are every bit as singular, as unique as each one of us. Right? We call ourselves individuals because each one of us has different fingerprints, each one of us has different personalities, each one of us has different faces, and every face is singular. Except, of course, between identical twins, but even in identical twins you can find different, slightly different personalities and slightly different gestures that make them also unique. But most of us that are not identical twins are unique, unrepeatable. Someone can make a clone out of you, but that clone will have a different embryological history, and they can certainly have a, a different socialization history, will be sent to different schools, will probably have different parents, and so on, that by the time it's your age, it may look like you, but it's not an identical copy of you. It's another individual that is unique. There's no way of creating two identical copies of organisms. Well, the same thing with species. Once we send species to extinction, as we humans do every single day by destroying their habitats, those species are not coming back. If there was zebrahood, then they would come back. You know, eliminate all zebras, because zebrahood will stay there, and then eventually zebrahood will incarnate again in new zebras. But once we kill the last zebra, once the last zebra dies, zebras are gone. Because a species zebra was every bit as unique, as, 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 as singular as we are. Maybe horses with black stripes and herbivorous behavior, eating habits and so on, will appear again, but there will be another species. The species that resembles zebras, just like your twin or your clone will resemble you, but they were not what we used to call zebras, because what we used to call zebras was a historical entity. A historical entity that was born and then died. So, this Reproductive isolation as produ producing species is the second way in which population thinking breaks with Aristotle. He tells you species are not a different category of, 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 uh, of beings than individuals. Species themselves are individuals 
only larger in space and time. Not only do they occupy a larger space because there are several reproductive communities in several ecosystems, but they also outlive individual zebras because they last for many generations. So they are a, 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 an individual that exists in a, in a larger spatial temporal context, but nevertheless an individual, a singular individual, which puts ethical pressures on us. Every time we kill or we, 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 we produce extinction of a species, we're killing something that is that will never ever come back again, which is different and a different ethical uh, load to bear than if we could say, well, but zebra hood is still there and eventually it will incarnate again in a zebra, so it doesn't really matter that we got rid of zebras because zebra hood is still there. There is no zebra hood. There are no essences. Everything is a process, and it's a historical process that produces singular individuals. Okay? One more thing before we go to class. Because the barriers that prevent genes from coming from the outside into a species are, there are historical, it also means that they are contingent. For Aristotle, the different... The, 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 the properties that made, made up a species were necessary. It is necessary that a horse is quadrupedal. It is necessary that a horse has hooves. It is necessary that it has fast speed and herbivorous eating habits and so on. Species are entirely contingent. Contingent doesn't mean arbitrary. Contingent simply means that just as it happened, it could have not happened. Just as there are humans in this planet, there could not be humans in this planet. Just think about that meteorite that killed the dinosaurs. Had that meteorite not come in, maybe mammals would not develop, and therefore humans would not develop. So we are here, but it's a contingent fact. There was no fate or destiny that said in advance humans must be in planet Earth. We are here, and therefore that's why we should be lucky and grateful no, no, should be lucky, should be grateful of our luck because there was no destiny pointing towards us. We appeared and now we are causing changes in our environment that might one day make us disappear, including nuclear weapons, including climate change, including all kinds of things that we're doing that would one day make us extinct because we did not appreciate the contingency of our origins. We thought we were the chosen species by God and therefore that we could never go away. It was necessary that we were here. Because these barriers are contingent, on the other hand, it also means that they can be breached. Everything that's contingent is breachable. Now how do we breach reproductive barriers? Through technology. Technology has now produced the, the means through which those things can be breached. Let me just give you one example and then we're going to go to, to take a break. In upstate New York, today, as we speak, there's a factory producing spider silk. Spider silk is a fabulous material because spider silk is, is very strong because it has to be the structural aspect of a spider web and it's also very elastic because it needs to capture insects in flight and then kind of, you know, trap them within, a kind of, within, the, within, its, within its web. But spiders are very hard to domesticate because they are predators. We domesticated silkworms a long time ago, or the Chinese domesticated silkworms a long time ago, and we've been producing you know, a, a, a textiles made of silk for many centuries, but no one has ever produced anything made of spider silk. So, because spider silk is so valuable, industrialists thought that they needed to produce spider silk. But, but we cannot domesticate spiders, so what do we do? Well, steal the genes for spider silk. This is a relatively easy, easy way of doing it. You just analyze the spider silk. You see the sequence of proteins that it has. Then we know the genetic code, and the genetic code can now translate those into, into genes. So now we have a gene for spider silk. And they introduce that gene into a domesticated animal, into a goat. 